Let me begin by, by uh, talking about the two main, two of the main themes uh, in the book. Uh, the first is that uh, successful and sustainable growth requires creating a learning society, uh, and uh, especially in the 21st century as we move to what might be called a knowledge economy. Uh, and uh, let me make a, uh, probably say, why I use the word learning, why we use the word learning society rather than learning economy, because what we're going to emphasize is the notion that learning uh, is, is really a, a broader societal thing. It's not just about economy. You can't actually isolate the economy from what's going on in the rest of society. So it's a, it's an added, it's a, it's a mindset that I'll describe a little bit more. And then the second observation is markets on their own don't do this. So that uh, it, it really says that there has to be an active role for government to try to do something to create uh, uh, a learning society. So uh, those are the basic uh, themes. So let me begin first by talking uh, about, what I'm going to do is talk about uh, each of these two themes in the abstract uh, on the importance of creating a learning society and on uh, why markets won't do it. And then I'll illustrate it by three particular applications of, of uh, these ideas. So uh, the, the important idea here is that the transformation to a learning societies that occurred around 1800 for Western economies and more recently for those in Asia has had a far greater impact on human well-being than improvements in allocative efficiency or resource, ac resource accumulation. That uh, if you ask, you know, uh, what has caused the increase in standards of living, it's not so much that we've saved more than people used to save uh, or that we got better in uh, making sure, to use the economist jargon, the marginal whatnots are equal to the marginal whatnots, which are uh, the determinants of allocative efficiency, but it's really about that we've learned how to do things better. And um, the important, in looking at this in historical perspective, what you see is that for basically all of history, uh, and we could go back well before 1000, standards of living were basically stagnant. And that it wasn't until around 1800 that they started to go up, and then they went up uh, basically super exponentially. And you can see this in, in uh, data that are collected uh, in various ways. And this is a chart that looks at uh, uh, data collected on real wages of London craftsmen for uh, 800 years, and you see exactly the same kind of pattern. And it's reflected not only in incomes, but in other dimensions uh, of living standards, most importantly, uh, life expectancy. And you see, uh, and we've gone back uh, before, you would have seen basically stagnant life expectancies until sometime around uh, uh, 1800, and then they started to uh, increase uh, very dramatically. The chart actually shows also the fact that some of the countries that were behind are beginning to catch up. And there, there was a divergence, and now we're in a process of convergence. Um, they, um, so that comes to the, the question, what caused these dramatic <laughs> changes? And the hypothesis that we're putting forth in the book is that the fundamental uh, uh, change that occurred was this notion of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was a really fundamentally change in mindset. And we can go back and to historical to try to understand what were the preconditions that led to the Enlightenment, but that's going too far into history. All I want to say is here, what really the, the, the dramatic change in our societies was, was the Enlightenment. And among the attributes of the Enlightenment that I want to focus on are questioning authority and recognizing that change was possible. It was also the Enlightenment was associated with creating uh, a scientific method, uh, which was a systematic approach uh, of figuring out how to improve productivity. And um, 
The final point uh, that I'll make, uh, but we probably won't have uh, time to go into it too much uh, today, which is that actually the politics and the economics are related, that the change in the mindset is also a change in mindset that affected politics and uh, played an important role in the creation of liberal democracy. Um, and that has an implication for the kinds of, of political systems that are going to work in sustaining uh, uh, th these kinds of increases in uh, uh, living standards. Now, uh, for those of you who are economists, I'll, I'll spend just a, a little bit of background of economic work on this. Um, traditionally, economists didn't pay very much attention to this issue of improvements in uh, technology. Uh, if you look at classic, uh, somebody like David Ricardo, it was all about farms and, and, and the allocation of labor, uh, diminishing returns. Uh, but uh, in the middle, early part of the 20th century, Schumpeter uh, put forward the idea that it was what was really important about market economies was innovation. Interestingly, his work uh, has never uh, or is, has barely been part of the mainstream of economics. That uh, um, it wasn't uh, until uh, uh, some of you here could probably comment on that, but it probably wasn't uh, uh, until Bob Solo around the, in 1957, 56, began to talk about it, that people began to talk about technological change. But in terms of the sources of productivity, Schumpeterian notions of innovation, um, what are the causes of technology change? Uh, very little work uh, uh, has been part of the mainstream in economics. Solo's idea, Solo's work was very influential, and he, he said something like 80% of all increases in standard of living were related to productivity, were, were related to technological change or something related to productivity increases, not to capital accumulation. Uh, and in the case of developing countries, uh, this change of perspective um, has begun to seep in. Uh, when I was chief economist of the World Bank, uh, the first report, the World Development Report, which is the annual report that's trying to bring in new uh, ideas into the development discourse, uh, we had one which was knowledge for development. And the basic idea was that what separated developing from developed countries was not so much a gap in resources, but a gap in knowledge. And that was a very major change because the World Bank had been constructed, established, to move capital from developed from to developing countries based on the hypothesis that what was really important was the gap in resources. And what we said is, well, you know, that's important, but it's not the most important thing. It was the gap in knowledge that was most important. Um, but finally, when you look more carefully, and this is one of the things that we emphasize in our book, even in developed countries, there are large gaps in productivity between the best firms and other firms. And that's really one of the points that's emphasized in, in your report on to, uh, a, a, a learning economy, that there's obviously been some impediment of learning, that there, we have a knowledge frontier way out here, but most firms are well below that. Uh, for those of you who had to suffer through training in economics, this idea is uh, really very under, it really undermines some of the basic tools that economists use because we talk about a production function as if everybody was on the frontier of the knowledge, was on the knowledge frontier. But in fact, uh, that construct doesn't is, is not a meaningful construct in a, in a fundamental sense because uh, almost all the firms are far below that frontier. And um, 
what all what this means in a way is that there are enormous increases in productivity that could be achieved by moving the firms towards the frontier or more broadly let me say if you take this learning perspective and you say learning is the source of increases in per standards of living then the force the the focus of economics and economic policy ought to be what do we do to increase uh, learning? So the basic idea is that knowledge doesn't flow uh, easily across frontiers. It doesn't flow easily within a firm, but firms are created actually to stop the flow of knowledge. That, that you know that knowledge is about profits, and therefore, the, the, uh, the notion is that you try to create in the firm an atmosphere that allows for the movement of knowledge within the firm, but you don't encourage uh, the disclosure of what you know to other firms. It happens at conventions and people talk, but in fact, uh, I, at least I know American firms are really very, very much discouraging people from uh, uh, sharing knowledge, uh, except that there's a quid pro quo. By the way, we, we argue within our book that this actually provides an alternative framework for the theory of the firm from that of Coase. Because Coase talked about the firm being based on transaction costs. We were saying one of the big advantages of, lar of firms is the free flow of knowledge. And there's a cost to the firm because it doesn't use the price system. It doesn't, you, you may not get as efficient allocation within the firm, but the free flow of knowledge is worth the, the cost and allocative efficiency. But I just want me to, to reiterate, what this says is the focus of policy or uh, uh, of analysis ought to be, how do we create a better learning environment that will lead to more learning? Um, the second point uh, theme is that markets on their own are not efficient in promoting uh, innovation. And this is an idea that, that has been around, uh, again, for a, for a long time, and the basic idea here is that knowledge is different, the production of knowledge, learning, is different from the production, say, of a table or a chair. And the critical property of knowledge is that it's what we call a Samuelsonian or pure public good. Knowledge is different from uh, ordinary goods in that an ordinary good has this property we call non-rivalrous consumption. If I consume a sandwich, no one else can consume that sandwich. But if I tell you what I just told you, I still know it, but now you know it. Or you may not believe it, but you know it. <laughs> so, so um, and, and um, you know, this is a very old idea. Uh, economists always, invent new language over old ideas, but, but Thomas Jefferson, who was our third president, put it much more poetically when he said knowledge is like a candle. When one candle likes another, it doesn't diminish from the light of the first candle. And that means that there's a fundamental tension between private markets and uh, efficiency. Once knowledge has been created, Efficiency requires the free dissemination of knowledge. And that, that leads to, to a, a point that you refer to uh, in the summary, but I, I don't know how much you said in the overall, because uh, I didn't read the whole, whole thing, but the overall, the, the point of the national innovation system, which is something that, that the work at Spru and Maastricht have, has, has highlighted, uh, um, that, that uh, how we produce knowledge is, is, and disseminate knowledge is, is absolutely critical. So what I just wanted to emphasize is that once we introduce the notion that knowledge is a public good, there is no presumption that the markets are efficient on their own in the production and dissemination of knowledge. So we've reversed the presumption, it's not only, in fact, it's, it's actually stronger. 
we've actually, in this book, we, we, we reversed the presumption of Adam Smith. The presumption in Adam Smith was that markets were efficient in the production of goods. Here we show that there's a strong presumption that private markets on their own are not efficient in the production and dissemination of knowledge. And that there's always scope for government intervention. Now what that nature of that kind of a, a, a intervention is, is something we can talk about. But there, the, 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 the important point is that the presumption that one begins with in the production of private goods has no validity in this area. And in fact, um, it's a result that's consistent with uh, a result that I think is important, uh, a theorem that I proved uh, with, Bruce, m with my co-author Bruce Greenwald uh, at the beginning of the 80s, which said that uh, whenever there is imperfect information, imperfect risk markets, that markets are essentially never efficient that there always exist some forms of intervention that will can make everybody better off. So it really turned Adam Smith on its head. When you're talking about innovation, there are always going to be incomplete risk markets. You can't buy insurance against the risk of a product that has not been created. Like, how could you in, 19, in, in, 19, uh, uh, in 1940 have a risk market for the risk of a nuclear reactor blowing up when nobody had conceived of that. So inevitably, you're not going to have good risk markets. And it's even worse than that because, in fact, the innovator always has more information about the possibilities of the innovation than others do. So you can't get insurance against most innovations. And so markets with innovation are almost inevitably imperfectly competitive, with imperfect, associated with imperfect capital markets and imperfect risk markets. So that actually means it reinforces the presumption against the deficiency of markets, because markets in which innovation is important suffer from all the other market failures endogenously, inherently. So um, uh, that's, the, the second point I want to raise is the policies that promote transformation to our learning society are markedly different than those traditionally advocated by economists, which focus on improving the static efficiency of resource allocation and the accumulation of capital. Um, and this is really uh, something I should emphasize. The two may be in tension with each other. They may be contradictory. So. Uh, uh, in a sense, we've long recognized that there's a conflict between static and dynamic, uh, and we've always struggled to try to get that right balance. So, for instance, intellectual property that you were talking about, we've always recognized that there was a tension between the dissemination of knowledge, free dissemination might lead to no incentive to produce knowledge, so we grant a monopoly power, which is the distortion in the market, in order to provide incentives. But uh, if I have time, which I probably won't, one of the things that we've learned now is that actually, if you have the improperly designed intellectual property regime, which we do, you actually get static inefficiency and dynamic inefficiency. You don't get as much innovation. So you lose on both accounts. So there. There can be a trade-off, but you can also be a situation where you get a lose-lose uh, 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 framework. So uh, this implies, as I said before, the central question of growth and development should be what should governments do to promote growth through learning. And what we do in the book is try to take a fairly comprehensive uh, look at some of the factors affecting learning. And the, the thrust of the book is that Almost everything we do affects learning, positively or negatively. And so we have to think about policies very carefully from this learning perspective. So it gives us another dimension that we ought to be learning, looking at as we assess policies. So that's, that's uh, uh, really what uh, we're looking at. And there are many dimensions, how they affect the capabilities, how they affect the incentives uh, for learning, 
how they facilitate learning and catalyze it, uh, how they impose impediments on the other hand, uh, a studying of how does learning occur, um, and about uh, learning to learn. You know, we actually are actually studying more about learning and we are improving our capacity to learn. And so what I'm going to do is talk about uh, a few of these uh, dimensions. And since I'm in Europe, I can't help but talk a little bit about the Euro crisis. And what I want to, as, to illustrate uh, the point uh, the, uh, uh, that it's pervasive, what I want to argue very briefly is, uh, and uh, there's a chapter in the book, uh, a couple chapters in the book, is that actually macro instability is very bad for learning. That in addition to all the other problems with the, with, with the, the European uh, macro malperformance is that it's undermining learning. Part of the reason for this, and I'll come back to that in the second theme, a lot of the learning, the, the basic point I want to make is a lot of the learning that occurs is not in formal schools but in on the job. And that uh, if there are no jobs, then there's no learning, particularly jobs for the 20 year olds. 20, you know, and so that's really the, the, the thing I want to emphasize. And uh, some of you know uh, that I've been chairman of this, uh, uh, I, I chair this International Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress. Its work has been continued at the OECD. And uh, one of the things that we've been talking about is how to get better measurements of GDP, including uh, what's happening to wealth. And we had a meeting in September where, where one of the themes was that actually the real cost of the Euro crisis has been vastly underestimated because normally there is an accumulation of human capital going on in this process of learning on the job every year, as well as formal education. <laughs> but that what's been not happening because of the crisis is there's not been this accumulation of human capital on the job training, and that's undermining the capital stock, the human capital stock in Europe. And if you took into account the diminution of the human capital stock in Europe, you would say that the cost of this crisis is much, much larger than the, what the uh, Eurostax reports. And the head of the Eurostax was at this meeting. So, I mean, I, I, he agrees with us, on, I think, on, uh, on this. So, so that our numbers are not capturing the real cost of the Euro crisis. Um, if that's true, of course, it means that future living standards, because of less learning has been going on, future living standards are going to be compromised. And this just is a chart that shows you the uh, trend growth. This is a chart I referred to yesterday. The trend growth in GDP um, from 1980 to 2010. The red line is where you would have been. Uh, the green line is where you are. And the purple line is the cumulative loss of GDP as a result of uh, the Euro crisis. And you will notice that the red and green line are not even uh, parallel. Uh, that there is no evidence that Europe is, you know, it, it, that the, the gap between where you would have been and where you are is actually increasing. So th this comes to what is missing here. The capital stock is the same, the, the, the labor, you know, what's missing. And th th this is the concept of missing real capital. Uh, we can talk about quantifying this missing real capital. What, something that you're not seeing, and the unobservable, because the unobservable is the unobservable learning that's going on. And we estimate that uh, as in the trillions of dollars. And so uh, this is all uh, examples of, of uh, the macroeconomic costs, which we think of as enormous. So let me go on to the second example, which is education. And uh, this echoes a lot of what's in your report, uh, and even with some of the vocabulary. Uh, the, uh, our, we argue you need to focus on learning to learn and lifelong learning. Uh, what we, we uh, suggest that only a small part of learning occurs in formal schooling. And actually, uh, 
Uh, my co-author, Bruce Greenwell, was very forceful in describing this. He says, you know, uh, formal schooling is uh, you have unmotivating students learning things that are unrelated to the world uh, versus the other part that's really important where you have people motivated in situations where there, there's clear relevance to what they learn. Anyway, he may exaggerate uh, that, but it's very clear that this informal learning on the job is, is very important and that, that, um, that the formal learning needs to be seen as uh, uh, the precursor to the uh, to learning uh, on the job. Um, one of the things I'm going to comment on very briefly is the changes in technology are allowing changes in learning, but there are also changes in the market structure that necessitate changing on how we think uh, about the structure of the learning process. And uh, the um, with that highlights is that uh, if you look, say, in the United States, uh, in most con advanced countries, there's m much less, there's much more labor turnover. Uh, it used to be people would go to GM and be a GM for the whole life, so GM could create a GM institute to train people because they could capture the benefits of that learning. Now, the average time that people are on a job is less than seven years in, in that context, it doesn't pay the employer. So that's going to necessitate rethinking uh, about um, uh, how education goes on post-graduation. And um, one of the, the uh, changes in technology are actually going to play a very important role. Uh, I don't know if you know about the MOOCs that have become very popular, like Coursera, uh, that are uh, becoming in a more important way. So it's, it's way of giving access to continuing education at a relatively low cost. In fact, they, they're doing it now for free uh, so that people can continue their education uh, uh, outside the job. Um, and uh, even if it's job related. And finally, uh, there's been a lot of change about thinking about education in developing countries that ex used to be focused on primary education. Now we recognize that you have to do, go beyond primary education if you're going to close the knowledge gap. I'm going to skip the next topic, which is uh, perspectives on trade. Uh, I just comment that uh, one of the things that the perspective that, that uh, uh, um, uh, we've emphasized is that the only way you learn about production is to produce. So Korea could not have become an efficient steel producer by reading a textbook. It was only by having a steel mill that they learned how to be an efficient steel producer. They got a steel mill they then figure, you know, the advice from the IMF and the World Bank was to stick to your knitting. Look at your comparative advantage. Your comparative advantage, they were told quite explicitly, growing rice, you ought to stick to growing rice. And Korea's response was thank you, but no thank you. And uh, their response was, if we, you know, we might be the, 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 the uh, best grower of rice in the world, but we will still be poor. And this is links to the main themes of our of our book is that different sectors in the economy have more learning potential and more learning spill spillovers, and that the market doesn't take into account these learning spillovers, and that therefore you ought to be think about what are the sectors with a lot of learning spillovers, because not correcting, it's, it's correcting market failures in a sense, and that uh, there have been enormous successes in doing this. Korea is an example where industrial policy, policies trying to shape the economy were very successful. And the result of it was that Korea wound up with the most efficient steel industry in the world, more, much more efficient than America's private steel industry. And there are many other examples of these successful countries. Um, so the other topic I wanted to talk about uh, very briefly is intellectual property. 
because it's an important part of uh, how we think about the promotion of innovation. Um, and I want to begin with the idea that intellectual property restricts the use of knowledge. And the problem is, you know, so the principle is we're willing to accept because of the dynamic benefits, but if you don't have well-designed intellectual property laws, you can uh, have negative dynamic benefits. And I can go through lots of, of examples. Uh, maybe I'll just mention a couple of the, of the, of the problems. Uh, one of them, uh, uh, recently a problem uh, in, uh, uh, in the United States are this notion of patent trolls and holdups, uh, where uh, uh, an example was a very little company spent a million dollars in research, six million dollars in legal fees, sued Intel saying that they had infringed on one of their patents. And uh, Intel is faced with a problem that it gets a gazillion of these suits. Most of them are not, have no validity. And the normal course of events would be you pay the guy $100,000 or a million dollars to go away. And, and you know, that's the way the American legal system, you pay them a good, to go away and you say that's life. It's part of the cost of doing business in America, it's lit litigious society. But Intel says there's a million of these people out there. If we settle, you know, sort of like, uh, uh, we don't like the idea that Europe pays uh, the ISIS for, uh, uh, all the uh, ransom for the people that ISIS captures, and the American attitude is we won't pay uh, ransom, uh, and they'd rather see the guy's head cut off. But uh, the the uh, Intel's position is they weren't going to pay the ransom, and so I don't know if you know the story. BlackBerry did pay a ransom, uh, uh, a very large ransom, to, to settle one of these uh, suits, but uh, Intel said no. And um, the traditional remedy in court, in American courts, is that uh, the court, uh, you, the, you apply to uh, the courts to uh, say, uh, the law had been, that uh, if you've infringed on my property, even if the patent is being questioned in the court, and it's not secure, as long as you hold the patent until it gets uh, invalidated, as long as you hold the patent until it's invalidated, you can shut down the guy. So uh, they went to the U.S., uh, this particular case, they went to, it was the Trade Commission, and said, uh, we want Intel to be shut down. So Americans would not be able to buy any advanced ships, no Apple computers, no HP computers using the advanced chip. There was a little provision in the, this particular patent law which said that there was an exception if it's not in the, not in the public interest. Uh, and I had the difficult task of trying to explain why this might not be in the public interest to shut down um, all of America's industry that was based on advanced chips. Well, you, you can imagine uh, it was not that hard but uh, it was very expensive for Intel to defend, and uh, they eventually won. The f patent was thrown out, actually, but that shows a, a patent system gone awry. Um, and there are a whole other set of problems called the patent thicket, uh, the long history of problems with our patent system. Um, just as an example, you know, it, the detailed provisions make a, a big difference you have a better, in Europe, a better provision called opposition uh, for challenging patents than we do in the United States. But there are a whole set of provisions that are, are, are uh, important. One of the other aspects of this that, that we highlight in the book is that more important than incentives in determining the pace of innovation is the set of productive opportunities that are available that people can use for innovation. And every innovation 
in a sense, with a patent law, takes out from the set of opportunities that others can use and adds to the set that others can use. Okay? So you both you, you use up ideas and you contribute to ideas. But if you don't have the right patent law, you can take out more than you contribute. You're using up the pool of ideas. And what we show is that the net flow of innovation, taking into account the impact on the flow of, of the stock of knowledge in the pool that's available, is such that the flow of innovations is lower with a, uh, a, a strong patent law that's not well designed. So the patent laws can actually impede uh, innovation. Well, um, let me stop there and, and open it up to questions because I think I've talked too long and, and if we have time at the end I'll go through some of the other slides.